This video is about the architectural principle we call encapsulation. Encapsulation is the result of what happens when you combine layering and packet switching. We want to break up our data into discrete units that we call packets. However, each packet contains data from multiple layers. When you send a TCP segment, for example, it's sitting inside an IP packet, which is in turn sitting inside an Ethernet frame. Encapsulation is how this works. Encapsulation is the principle by which you organize information in packets so that you can maintain layers, yet let them share the contents of your packets. Recall that layering lets you take a complex system and break it down into smaller parts. Each layer provides a service, an abstraction of the network to the layers above. It provides this abstraction by using the layer below it. Each layer is self-contained, so as long as it provides the surface expected of it, layers above don't need to worry about how. This separation of concerns means each layer can evolve independently. Just as IP at the network layer doesn't need to have to worry about changes to TCP at the transport layer, application layers such as HTTP don't have to worry about changes to TCP. For example, the past few years, most operating systems have changed the exact TCP algorithms they used to better handle increasing network speeds. But a web browser works fine using both the old algorithms and the new ones. Note that this picture of layers uses the seven-layer OSI model. So let's scrunch back down to the four-layer model. Encapsulation is the principle that lets us take protocol layers and let them easily share the storage within a packet. It's how layering manifests in the actual data representation. The way this works is each protocol layer has some headers, followed by its payload, followed by some footers. For example, an IP packet header has a source address and a destination address. To send a TCP segment with IP, we make the TCP format the payload of the IP packet. In this way, the pack IP packet encapsulates the TCP segment. IP doesn't know or care what its payload is. It just delivers packets to an end host. When the packet arrives, the host looks inside the payload, see that it's a TCP segment, and processes it accordingly. So here's a more complete example. Let's say that you're browsing the web using a computer connected through Wi-Fi, wireless Ethernet. Your web browser generates an HTTP GET request. This GET request is the payload of a TCP segment. The TCP segment encapsulating the HTTP GET becomes the payload of an IP packet. This IP packet, in turn, encapsulating the TCP segment and the HTTP GET is the payload of a Wi-Fi frame. If you were to look at the bytes your computer sends, they'd look like this. The outermost encapsulating format is the Wi-Fi frame, inside of which is an IP packet, inside of which is a TCP segment, inside of which, finally, is the HTTP GET. So how Nick has drawn this packet brings up something you might find very confusing. It turns out there are two ways to draw packets. The difference comes from your background and what part of the system you work on. Nick has drawn the packets here where the headers are on the right, the first bit of the packet is on the right, and the last bit of the packet is on the left. This makes total sense. As a router or which switch sends a packet, we draw the packet moving from left to right. So the first bit to leave the router or switch is the one at the far right. But I draw packets the other way, where the headers are on the left <laughs> and the footers are on the right, like this. This second approach comes from software. It's what you'll see when you read IETF documents and many other protocol specifications. The idea is that the beginning of the packet comes at address zero. So the first byte of the header is at address zero. Since addresses increase from left to right, this means the beginning of the packet is on the left and the end of the packet is on the right. Of course, there isn't a right way or a wrong way here. Both ways of drawing packets are valuable and depend on what you're using the drawing for. So you should be comfortable with both. Uh, I'll generally draw headers on the right. And I'll generally draw them on the left. Nick's background is electrical engineering and switch design. Mine is computer science and protocol software. So now let's go back to Nick's example of an HTTP GET inside a TCP segment, inside an IP packet, inside a Wi-Fi frame. Let's see what this looks like in an actual network with Wireshark. Before we started this recording, I turned on Wireshark and recorded a packet trace of a web request. Let's look at just one packet. Here, we can see how Wireshark tells us that it's an Ethernet frame, inside which is an IP packet, inside which is a TCP segment, inside which is an HTTP GET. If I click on each of these protocol headers, then Wireshark actually highlights where they are in the packet bytes, these, these gobbledygook below. Wi-Fi comes first. Inside Wi-Fi is IP. Inside IP is TCP. 
and inside TCP, we can see the text of our HTTP GET. This very simple approach of encapsulating protocols within each other gives you tremendous flexibility. So far, we've been talking about the four-layer model as something completely static and inflexible. In practice, it's not like that. You can actually use encapsulation to recursively layer protocols. For example, something that's very commonly used today in offices and businesses is something called a virtual private network, or VPN. With a virtual private network, you open a secure network, a secure connection to a network you trust, such as your office. For example, using transport layer security, TLS. When you communicate with the internet and send IP packets, rather than send them normally, you send them inside this VPN connection. So the IP packets go to your office network. At that point, the office network can route them normally. This lets you do things like access private protected network resources inside your office. So rather than sprinkle network protections everywhere, you just have to be careful with one service, the service that lets people log into the network over the virtual private network. You do this with a virtual private network or VPN gateway, a computer that accepts connections from permitted VPN clients and forwards their traffic into the private network. So what does that look like? Let's say I'm accessing my internal company website. Well, my web browser generates an HTTP GET. Like usual, it puts this inside a TCP segment, which it puts inside an IP packet destined to the company's internal web server. But rather than put this IP packet inside a link layer frame, I can't directly communicate with the internal web server. My computer puts this IP packet inside a TLS segment, a secure segment. TLS protects the message and keeps it secret. This TLS session is inside a TCP stream that terminates at the virtual private network gateway. So the outer TCP segment is inside an IP packet destined to the virtual private network gateway. We put this outer IP packet inside a link frame and send it to the next top normally. So it looks like this. HTTP, inside TCP, inside IP, inside TLS, inside TCP, inside IP, inside Ethernet. Now you've learned about encapsulation, the principle that unifies layering and packet switching. Encapsulation is how we take protocol layers and assemble them into packets in a way that's flexible and maintains their separation of concerns. You saw an example of a computer, how a computer can encapsulate a rep. Okay, I'm going to start this slide again. <laughs> <laughs> we need to just keep that as a blooper. <laughs> now you've heard about encapsulation, the principle that unifies layering and packet switching. Encapsulation is how we take protocol layers and assemble them into packets in a way that's flexible and maintains the separation of concerns. You saw an example of a computer that encapsulates a web request, as well as an example how one can use encapsulation in a more complex way for something like a virtual private network.